There we go. Uh, chapter zero, I don't think you actually have in your books. Um, it, what it is, just an overview. So where are we going to go? So we're going to talk about uh, vibration in general in a very introductory way, and then talk about terminology, uh, decibels, logarithmic scaling, linear scaling, frequency response, uh, spectra, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll have a chapter on octaves as well. So again, chapter two, pretty much terminology, things you've probably heard before. Uh, chapter three, without a doubt, is the meat of the day. It's dynamic force and motion, where we talk about natural frequencies, resonance, damping, uh, transmissibility, all of those kinds of things, degrees of freedom. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about waveforms, filtering, um, and uh, different types of signals, uh, sinusoidal signals, complex signals, and random signals. Then we'll graduate from there and talk about random vibration. And then since uh, a lot of you either work or uh, work with uh, shakers, we'll talk about, uh, about shakers. There's uh, a shaker is just the machine that generates this vibration in a controlled way, which is the machine that we want to use. Uh, every shaker has its pluses and minuses, and there's a lot of different ways to get this vibratory motion. Uh, you can't get one shaker that does it all, and we'll talk about various ways to try to deal with that. Uh, there's a chapter on fixture design, and uh, then you do have to measure vibration. You have to measure accelerations or displacements or velocities and frequencies, all those kinds of things. We'll talk about how to measure vibration and actually talk about all kinds of a lot of different types of sensors as well. Uh, chapter nine is a way to uh, illustrate and, uh, and visualize vibration in the lab uh, using the frequency spectrum or spectrum analysis as opposed to a time history representation. Then chapter 10 talk, uh, starts talking about vibration testing in general. And then once we uh, have, have talked about the the idea of vibration testing in the lab, then we're going to split it into sine vibration testing and random vibration testing, two different aspects of vibration tests. Uh, chapter 13 is a uh, reasonably uh, comprehensive chapter on fatigue. We'll talk about stress versus number of cycles to failure curves, fracture mechanics, uh, different ways to predict fatigue life. Uh, chapter 14 is a, uh, a reasonably quick chapter on modal analysis and modal testing. If there's one thing we get out of the chapter on modal analysis, the modal analysis sounds kind of neat. And you've probably heard that term, modal analysis, modal testing, and it sounds pretty high tech. But basically, all modal analysis is is trying to generate a displacement map as to how the thing moves. That simple. Uh, I have a chapter on accelerated testing. We'll uh, talk about uh, highly accelerated life testing, high accelerated stress screening, and different ways that you can decrease the test time by changing the test conditions. Because if we have a product that has a 25-year lifespan, we don't want to run a 25-year test. Uh, we'll talk a bit about environmental stress screening as well. And then to finish things up, we'll talk about shock in general, and then we'll tilt shock to uh, away from the test lab and talk about design to withstand shock. And the very last chapter is a discussion of standards, specifications, and procedures, and the similarities and differences in those. Uh, now what we've done, uh, or tried to do, is to shuffle some of the brass tacks of this material back into the appendix and the appendices. So this is some of the material that's in the appendices, and I'll probably refer to it from time to time. Things like equation derivations and uh, things like that we put back in the appendix. Da, 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 okay. Yes, I talked about that. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll have an entire chapter on shakers. Um, come on. There's an example of one. We'll see this picture again. So let's see if I get my thing going here. There we go. Ah. I guess this is just an artifact of slow Wi-Fi, huh? Okay, so there's the shaker itself. We'll also talk about these things, which are uh, we refer to as slip tables. So this shaker right here shakes up and down this way. So it's an axial shaker. If you rotate it over and attach it to this plate, then the plate can slide back and forth that way. So you can get horizontal and vertical out of one machine. Uh, in the discussion of fixture design, we'll talk about this green thing right here. Uh, 
as, as I was joking about earlier, that a lot of people consider a fixture is just an adapter. That's all we need to do is to match the bolt pattern of this thing to the shaker. And they say, okay, as long as the bolt patterns match, everything is going to be fine. Uh, not true. Um, and it turns out, and we'll go over this at length, in fixture design, it is the dynamic performance of the fixture that's important, not the static performance. So a lot of engineers will sit down and they'll design their fixture based on static stress-based design. And they'll go, okay, I have designed my fixture so that all of the stresses are below yield, so it's going to be fine. It won't break. Fine, it won't break, but it could resonate and do all kinds of strange things without breaking. So designing for fixture stiffness is the important part of fixture design, which is something that a lot of mechanical engineers don't do. They'll go straight to stress-based designs. And there's an example of a fixture. We'll talk about fixture fabrication methods as well. This one happens to be bonded. Uh, we'll talk about sine waves in, uh, at the very beginning because sine waves are easy to understand. And also, we'll illustrate that if you uh, have any ugly, strange-looking wave, you can actually reconstruct it as a series of sine waves. So if you have a square wave, for instance, you can decompose a square wave into a bunch of sine waves. So if you can do that, then knowledge of the sine wave is reasonably important. So we'll start with there, and then knowing about the sine wave, we'll talk about sine vibration testing. Uh, one of the things we'll say about sine vibration testing is that it is a very, very poor representation of the outside world. However, it has the advantage of being much easier to understand the results of. And uh, one of the most common uh, sine vibration tests is a swept sine, where you'll take the sinusoidal waveform, the sinusoidal waveform here, and at, let's say in this case, a constant amplitude, you will increase the frequency from low to high and then back to low. So it's called a a sine sweep test. And there's just a block diagram of one. Uh, turns out the random vibration is a more representative simulation of the outside world. Road surface, uh, tire noise, uh, a lot of times that uh, aircraft in flight experience random vibration. So this is a little more realistic but it's harder to predict because actually the definition of random means that you can't predict the, the amplitude at any point in time. So we'll go through, if you can't predict what the amplitude is, how can you run this test in a controlled way? Well, you use statistics to try to understand how to control it and how to analyze it. And we'll go through random vibration tests as well. There's an example of a random vibration uh, spectrum, if you will. Uh, so this is uh, not a spectrum, it's time history. So this is amplitude versus time here. You can see that the amplitude varies randomly in time, and indeed the frequency varies randomly in time as well. And uh, some of you have probably seen this term before under, under random vibration, g squared per hertz. Uh, we'll go through where that comes from. It's a really weird unit. And there's a block diagram that we'll talk about in random vibration tests as well, and we'll talk about time history reproductions, as opposed to the frequency domain. So if we have this time-based sinusoid, we want to see what its frequency content is. We will convert it into the frequency domain where we can see energy versus frequency in hertz or cycles per second. So this gives us a really good way to illustrate and see what the frequency content of a signal is, because the human eye does not pick out frequency content very well in the time domain. So if you convert it into the frequency domain, it's easier to see. And I'll show a number of illustrations of that. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we're going to do for random vibration. So this is a randomly varying signal with time. Then we're going to plot here the probability of certain peaks occurring. So what you'll find out is low amplitude peaks occur a lot, high amplitude peaks don't occur very often. And we'll use that distribution to try to understand and control random vibration tests. And on Thursday we'll talk about shock and we'll just illustrate the different types of shocks, the big 
Uh, similarity here is that you have some sort of amplitude versus time, and that is the two things at a minimum that need to be defined if you're trying to describe a shock. Just the elastic impact, the half sine pulse right there, that has, let's just say, 40 Gs over 10 milliseconds. That is the bare minimum you would have to tell someone to have that data make any sense. You might hear people say, oh, my thing is good to 5,000 Gs. That doesn't mean anything without declaring what the time and the shape is. It's not uncommon for something to be able to survive 5,000 Gs at 0.1 milliseconds, but 500 Gs at 10 milliseconds will break it. So you do have to give more information. And again, uh, amplitude and time is the bare minimum. We'll talk about different ways to generate shock. Uh, pulses as well. So that's where we're going.